and I'm giving the word to, to Elisa for the second part of her presentation. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, voila. Okay, I start again from this slide here, uh, which shows <clears throat> one application of uh, what I told before about elevation dependent warming taken from one of our studies mentioned here. We can, of course, provide also the research papers if you are curious and want to, to take a look. Um, this is a model study uh, on elevation dependent warming in the Tibetan plateaus, plateau Himalayas again. Uh, this was one of the region for uh, uh, project reasons which I worked on more uh, over the past 10 years. So this is the reason why you will see many examples uh, taken from this area. Um, in this uh, study, we used uh, uh, the almost entire ensemble of uh, uh, CMIP-5 global climate model. This is the um, not latest, uh, but almost latest generation of global climate models used by the IPCC, because the latest is going to be used now for the sixth uh, IPCC assessment report. These models are those uh, used in the fifth IPCC asset assessment report published in 2013. Uh, these models are GCMs, global climate models. So if you remember our modeling chain, uh, they occupy the, the first step of the chain, the very first step. And these are characterized by very different spatial resolutions, which are indicated here in the second column in degrees. Uh, and in the, in the um, uh, right-hand column, you have the number of grid points uh, in, in the area under study, which is shown here in the figure. Uh, in terms of resolution, we can say that the highest resolution in this ensemble is of about 75 kilometers per 75, uh, times 75 kilometers. So quite big, in fact, uh, um, grid size, but small compared to the average resolution of the global climate models. And the coarsest is about uh, uh, 300 kilometers, more or less, so very, very, very large one. Uh, of course, we have analyzed before using these models to make uh, studies on elevation dependent warming in the Tibetan Plateau Himalayas. We have studied, for example, the extent to which these models were able to reproduce the real topography of the area in order to see the extent to which they underestimated, for example, the highest elevations as expected. So we did some preliminary analysis and uh, we excluded some models from the ensemble, those uh, who clearly were not uh, very much able to uh, reproduce uh, uh, in a realistic way the, the orography and the topography characteristics of, of the area under study. Um, the aim was to study elevation dependent warming, so uh, we applied uh, our methodology. So first of all, calculating uh, warming rates or temperature trends or even temperature changes uh, intended as the difference between two long-term climatologies. For example, in this case, the top figure here uh, shows the, exactly the minimum temperature change between the 2071-2100 climatology, so the average of the temperature in this 30-year-long time period in the future, so we used the climate projections under a very high emission scenario. Uh, it is the so-called RCP 8.5 scenario, which means uh, a business as usual scenario. So let's uh, uh, continue with the emission like we did in the past, the, the most extreme, the most pessimistic scenario. So the climatology between uh, calculating in the period 2071-2100 under this scenario uh, minus the climatology uh, in the period 1971-2000, so one past climatology. So this difference is exactly plotted in that figure here, showing that we have, uh, of course, uh, a warming in this area up to 7.5 7 degrees Celsius projected in the future. So we expect uh, temperature increases up to about uh, 7.5 degrees Celsius at the end of the century compared to uh, the past. And this is the ensemble of uh, the ensemble mean of all the models listed in the previous slide. So we 
we, we cannot use just one single model. Uh, you will not never probably find some research paper using just one model, except that if you want to validate the model which you have probably contributed to build. But when you make assessment studies on future warming, for example, you will always see um, the use of uh, entire model ensembles for which you can build the statistics, uh, uh, calculating a mean, calculating some standard deviation. So this is the mean of all model realizations. Mm? This is very important to, to keep in mind. And the second step of our procedure to calculate elevation dependent warming is to calculate a relationship between these temperature changes or warming rates, let's call them in this way, and the elevations. And you see this relationship in the bottom uh, figure. So you have the warming rates in the y-axis and the elevation in meters uh, in the x-axis. And so you can see how this correlation uh, take, takes place in a way. Uh, if you uh, use and assume a linear regression model, which is an, uh, an approximation, as you can clearly see also from this figure, you can use the slope of this linear regression to quantify the elevation dependent warming. Mm? Um, this is a common approach to uh, use uh, uh, and assume a linear regression to quantify elevation dependent warming. So many studies are showing more and more often that uh, the relationship between warming rates and the elevation is very from, far from being linear. And this uh, figure here uh, also clearly shows this aspect here. Here we, we also have, if you, if you carefully look at the figure, like a kind of step behavior with a different slope uh, of this regression below and above uh, a given elevation. And in this case, 2,500 meters more or less, which is not uh, by chance. I will explain this uh, in a while. Um, this slide here uh, is full of elements, but just look uh, at the second row plots here. These are the relationships between warming rates and the elevation again for the entire model ensemble. So you have the mean as before. They are the blue and red line. Blue line refers to the minimum temperature, so the, the um, nighttime temperatures. The red line, the diurnal uh, temperatures, maximum temperatures. Uh, the, the thick lines are uh, the, just the model mean, but the gray shaded, uh, gray shaded area represents the whole ensemble of the models. So you can see that uh, it is a huge ensemble and the spread among the different models is, is not so small. So this is something which has to be again kept in mind considering the uncertainty of this model um, results. But what you can see is that for each season, here we have in the first column uh, winter, uh, spring, uh, summer, and autumn, uh, if you look at the second row plots, you can clearly see a positive relationship between warming rates and the elevation with this specific two-step behavior, two-fold behavior in, uh, in winter in particular for the minimum temperature. This means that uh, these models overall project um, amplified warming at higher elevation at the end of the century compared to lower elevations. This is important. So elevation dependent warming is expected to occur in the Himalayas at the end of the century under a high emission scenario. Uh, this is particularly true for the minimum temperature in the cold seasons, like for example, winter or even spring, and in the maximum temperature in the warmer seasons, like summer or autumn. The fact that you have here this uh, twofold behavior with a different uh, pattern below and above the 2000 meter more or less altitude is important because uh, this uh, is like a sort of hint to better understand what could the mechanism driving this phenomenon uh, be. Uh, and in fact, the 2000 meter elevation corresponds to the altitude of the zero degree isotherm. And this is important because this in a way means that uh, the water phase change 
and the slow albedo feedback can play a very important role in determining elevation dependent warming in this area in that season and for that variable, the minimum temperature in this case. And in fact, the, the, the other step, uh, I will not go into the detail of that because it will take a, a lot of time, was to analyze the mechanisms driving this elevation dependent warming. Uh, starting from the uh, assumption that uh, temperature change at the surface uh, occurs uh, as a response to the energy balance and all the factors which can act to increase the net flux of energy at the surface can uh, lead to uh, an increase of the temperature and can lead to elevation dependent warming. So we considered in our study all the variables simulated by the models whose change may be related to a temperature change and may potentially give rise to elevation dependent warming. All these variables are, for example, the change in albedo, of course, the change in specific humidity, the change in uh, downward long wave radiation, the change in downward short wave radiation, so that which directly comes from the sun. We developed uh, a method to select mostly contribute or potentially contribute to elevation dependent warming and we built a multiple linear regression model to assess the relative importance of these variables. And I can just say that for this region, the most important variables recognized as possible elevation dependent warming drivers are the change in albedo as uh, the plot uh, uh, referring to the minimum temperature in winter already suggested also accompanied by the changes in the downward long wave radiation and the changes in specific humidity which are related with each other, with each other uh, because of what we uh, said before about the, this, this feedback mechanism. Uh, many other studies have been performed, of course, not only by our group, of course, uh, about elevation dependent warming in different mountain areas. I would like just to mention one of these uh, uh, studies because uh, this study uh, published by, by our group uh, analyzed elevation dependent warming in different mountain regions of the northern hemisphere mid latitude. Uh, the Rocky Mountains, uh, the uh, greater alpine region, including uh, uh, the Alps, the European Alps, and uh, the Indukush Karakorum and Tibetan Plateau again. These are very different mountain regions, but at least they are located in the same latitude band. It is important to, to say this because uh, we are now analyzing elevation dependent warming in the Andes, which uh, uh, include both tropical and subtropical areas in another hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, and the results are different. So it's important to say where we are, uh, where we are studying this phenomenon. And one important uh, aspect of this um, study here uh, is uh, in many aspects, in, in fact. One is that we used uh, not uh, different models, but one models run under different uh, Mm, spatial resolutions because uh, this is the model which we run in, in our group so we have the possibility to change a lot of uh, setup and uh, one of these setups was to change the resolution at which the model is run starting from 16 kilometers which is very very high for a global climate model up to 125 kilometers and what we discovered is that of course the high spatial resolution is important only in the very small regions like the greater alpine region in this case. Another important result of this study is that the region which is found to be more prone to elevation dependent warming is the Himalayas Tibetan Plateau when compared to the other regions and that the season showing the most striking evidence of elevation dependent warming in all regions is autumn. This is important because autumn is like a transition region between snow free and snow covered areas, a transition season, of course, between summer and winter. So climate warming is delaying the onset of snow cover at low and mid elevations. And this trend is expected to, expected to continue in the future and is expected to involve also higher and higher elevations. Therefore, larger snow free areas are expected in autumn. And this is the reason why we probably uh, identified autumn as the um, season where elevation dependent warming is most 
evident and the albedo change at the same time as the most important elevation dependent warming driver in these studies and in these areas. Okay, uh, the last, uh, I think, figure about elevation dependent warming is, looks very, very complicated and it is, but I wanted to, to show this figure because it, it is one of the figures, uh, uh, again, uh, appearing in the latest IPCC uh, report on the ocean and the cryosphere in a changing climate. I've contributed to, the, to write in this chapter here uh, and, and to make this figure. So for me, it's quite, uh, quite nice to show you that. Just a look, uh, for example, at the Indukush Karakorum again, this uh, set of plots here. What you see in this figure is the change of winter snow cover in the first plot here in the, in the x-axis, the change of winter air temperature and the change of summer air temperature in the third plot against the elevation, which is shown in the y-axis. For example, look at the middle plot here. What you can see is that the change of winter air temperature is expected to increase, in fact, with the elevation. You see that there is a slight positive trend as the elevation increases up to a certain altitude, up to about 4,000 meters. Then uh, the temperature increase in a way stabilizes. This is because probably above 4,000 meters, uh, there are no um, significant changes in snow and ice cover at ground, which uh, uh, makes the snow albedo feedback less effective here in determining um, changes in the temperature. Okay. Uh, this is only one example. I really uh, suggest you to take a look at this report by, because like every IPCC assessment report uh, is a scientific one, but uh, the language is not so hard and the information which is provided is very, very useful. Um, okay. Uh, I would like to spend the last part of my talk talking about another variable, which is precipitation. Uh, some slide about uh, will be about uh, uh, the first studies, in fact, I performed when I moved to Torino to uh, also move uh, and to also start studying uh, more in detail mountain climates. Uh, so I will show examples of precipitation changes and variability in the Indukush Karakorum and Himalaya region again. Um, this is actually a very interesting region. I think that probably some of you students come from that area. I don't know uh, if so better. Uh, and uh, this is an interesting area because uh, uh, it is also complex in terms of climatic regimes. And this is the reason why when studying especially precipitation changes and dynamics and evolution, in this part of the world, it is worth probably dividing at least in two sub areas uh, the, the wide domain. Um, one area located in the westernmost part, uh, that's called Indukush Karakorum, uh, and the other area in the easternmost part, the Himalayas. Uh, because these two areas are prone to very different climatic patterns, uh, leading to different precipitation regimes, sometimes leading also to different uh, um, answers or responses in the cryosphere system. Uh, let's uh, uh, describe the Indukush Karakorum, the westernmost part, versus the Himalayas, the easternmost part. In the westernmost part, the Indukush Karakorum, we have not uh, a, a uh, climate which is dominated by the monsoon, which is, uh, uh, on the contrary, the most important, uh, probably, climate characteristic in the easternmost part. So, in the westernmost part, precipitation is not concentrated only in summer, like in the easternmost part, but we have uh, huge precipitation amount in uh, mm, winter and early spring, which are carried on so-called western weather patterns. So westerly winds, winds coming from, from the west, from the Mediterranean, from the Atlantic regions, bringing uh, humidity and precipitation during winter. Um, and also leading to a huge humidity transport toward the Karakorum. Uh, 
Probably these different precipitation climatology, which are observed in the westernmost part of the whole Himalayan chain in Akorum, and in the easternmost part also uh, gave rise to a, a different part, pattern of climate change in the Karakorum with respect to the Himalayas, with some observations of stable or slightly advancing glaciers in that region compared to the overall retreating glaciers in the easternmost Himalayas. Uh, moreover, at least in the past, uh, this westernmost part was characterized by decreasing trends in summer precipitation and increasing trends in winter precipitation, which probably are two causes of uh, stable glaciers in that area. Uh, all these uh, aspects, of course, uh, uh, call for uh, uh, separately treating and analyzing the westernmost and the easternmost part of uh, this, uh, this area. Uh, and we did so in our study. We considered the westernmost domain and the easternmost domain, and we started analyzing the precipitation climatology in these two areas, using what? Using the same uh, kind of observational data sets, which I talked about at the beginning of my lecture. So, in situ stations, gridded data sets, reanalysis data, satellite observations, and trying to uh, extract most of the information from these very different data sets. An interesting thing is that in spite of their differences, in spite of the biases, so the, the difference with each other, they are quite coherent um, in represent the different precipitation climatologies in these two parts of the, of the chain. Look at the easternmost part, so-called Himalaya. Uh, you can see that all the data set which we used reproduce a unimodal precipitation distribution with a peak in summer, in July and August. Because this is the manifestation, of course, of the summer monsoon dynamics. Mm? This area is prone to the summer monsoon, which occurs overall from June to September. The westernmost part, instead, has both the summer peak, which is due to the intrusions in a way of the monsoon up to uh, those uh, areas, but also to uh, the presence of the winter time precipitation, which is uh, related to the arrival of these western weather patterns. And it is interesting to see that uh, even the coarse scale data sets uh, are able, in fact, to reproduce this double peak structure in the Karakorum. So our uh, uh, idea was to to see whether also the climate models, and in particular the global climate models, so those which have the coarsest possible resolution, uh, were able to reproduce the same different uh, precipitation patterns in these two very different areas. We used again the same models as uh, in the, the other studies on elevation dependent warming and uh, reproduced the precipitation cycle with the whole model ensemble. I, I hope you can see here the gray lines, for example, here in the, in the right plot, you see that uh, we, we just plot uh, with the green and uh, pink lines uh, the precipitation cycle provided by the two longest observational data sets, mm? while the gray lines are the annual cycle reproduced by the different climate models, and the other lines are just the average of the models in the present and in future condition, but just skip these lines. Just focus on the gray lines compared to the two uh, pink and green observational lines. In the Himalayas, you see that uh, even though uh, there are uh, important uh, differences in terms of the total amount, for example, of precipitation, which is uh, produced by the models, at least all models reproduce a unimodal precipitation distribution with a maximum in summer. But if you look at the Karakorum here, you see that there is a total mess in a way. Uh, and uh, and uh, we have the impression that the different model repro models reproduce very different precipitation climatologies. We wanted to go more into the details of that, and we decided to uh, make a clusterization of the model, dividing them according to the type of annual cycle which they reproduced in these two different areas. This clusterization analysis uh, led to 
these results here. Again, look at the bias. As already shown, uh, we already knew that the models were able to reproduce the unimodal precipitation annual cycle. Uh, but uh, you can see that there is one model cluster which is very, very close, the best performing one compared to the observations, almost completely overlapped to the observations. The other uh, model clusters are not bad, of course, but uh, uh, present some biases or some shift, for example, in the maximum. In the Karakorum, in the westernmost part, we see that there is only one model cluster which is able to reproduce the double peak structure, so to see precipitation in both winter and in summer. The other model clusters have an interesting characteristic. They are not able to reproduce the summer time peak in precipitation, probably because the resolution is too coarse to see the intrusion of the monsoon in this relatively small area compared to the resolution of the models which we are using. And uh, we tried to go into the details of the model structure and we tried to understand what uh, were the characteristics of the best performing models. And what we saw is that in the Himalayas, the best performing models were those which incorporated the uh, effects of the aerosol particles, including the indirect effect of the aerosol particle. That is, those which uh, um, are related to the cloud formation. While in the Karakorum, the best performing models were those at higher resolution. So here, the resolution is very important to be able to reproduce this double peak structure. Here is another example which uh, uh, gives me the opportunity to go to the, uh, to the following slide, just to show you which, how big can the spread of the model be uh, in reproducing the precipitation time series in these areas. In the top panels, you see the Himalayas, so the easternmost part, in the bottom panels, the Karakorums, and the two columns are two different seasons. Mm, it is not important to go into the details now, but just to show uh, how large is, is the model spread here. The, the gray shaded area uh, represents the entire model ensemble, while the, the thick lines, they are mean. So it is important to, to consider that this model can have huge uncertainties, especially for variables like precipitation, especially in very complex mountain regions. And this gave me the opportunity to open another small parenthesis about, uh, especially about the models, but which is also useful to better interpret the, the, the outputs which come from the models and which we use to, to uh, understand and to make our future projections of climate change. Uh, that is uh, uh, the source of model uncertainty in global and regional um, model simulations. There are three main sources of uncertainties. Uh, there is uh, an uncertainty coming from the internal climate variability. We already mentioned this kind of variability that related, for example, to the feedback mechanisms, to uh, the coupling between atmosphere and ocean, to the teleconnections like, like El Nino Southern Oscillation, for example. Uh, there is a modeling uncertainty, uh, typically an uncertainty related to the way we build the model. And there is a scenario uncertainty, so an uncertainty related to the future evolution of the society, especially in terms of our behaviors, for example, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, of land use changes, et cetera, et cetera. The internal variability uh, can be um, quantified running uh, different, uh, running uh, so-called multi-member ensembles, that is uh, using just one model, but uh, uh, run under different uh, initial conditions. So you have a small ensemble constituted by this models, uh, by um, uh, members of the same model, which are run under different initial conditions. This is important to uh, sample the initial condition uncertainty. The modeling uncertainty is the structural uncertainty and the parametric uncertainty. Uh, the structural uncertainty comes from the different ways we use to approximate the climate system when we build the model. 
The parametric uncertainty comes from the different parameters which are used in the models to, for, exa for example, uh, build parametrizations or uh, when we tune the model, for example, or when we use empirical formulas uh, to reproduce uh, all those uh, processes which uh, cannot be described by some known equation. Mm? And this is sampled by multi-model ensemble, not multi-member ensembles like before, but multi-model ensemble. So taking the models produced by different institutions, like those used in the studies which I discussed before. And finally, the scenario uncertainty. As I was saying before, the uncertainty in global socioeconomic development uh, of the society and associated greenhouse gas and aerosol emissions. Aerosol is also a very important player in the climate system. And an important aspect is that if we run the model for long uh, time frames, the scenario uncertainty is the one which increases a lot as the time goes ahead. Uh, and this is quite obvious because uh, uh, the uncertainty related to our behavior is probably the most difficult to predict. Uh, okay, I, I show also this figure here because this is an example of multi-member ensemble. The one I was uh, mentioning before, uh, useful to sample the internal climate variability. This is a multi-member ensemble um, build uh, using the East Earth model. This model, which we also use in our group and which is also used in other uh, countries in Europe. Uh, every country uh, run a member of these models and just changes a, a little bit the initial conditions and producing a small ensemble. And I'd like to let you see in particular what are the projections for precipitation in the Himalayas during summer up to the 21st century, because this is the only situation in which we found an increase of total precipitation in the future. This is interesting because we tried to better understand the reason why we projected an increase in total precipitation in the future under a quite extreme emission scenario. And we found that, in fact, the increase of total pre precipitation is related to an increase of high precipitation intensity. That is a trend toward more episodic and more intense monsoonal precipitation event in this area. OK, the last example, just to, 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 to close and to finish with this uh, fast overview, uh, is not about uh, elevation dependent warming in mountain areas, but, but so called elevation dependent change in climate extremes. So we are not only interested in what happens to the uh, mean, uh, to the average of the most important climate variables like temperature and precipitation, but also to their climatic extremes, including, for example, um, uh, the lengths of of dry days, so of days uh, with low or no precipitation, the high precipitation intensity, uh, heat waves, so so-called climatic extremes. And what we uh, are uh, seeing in this paper, which is in preparation, is that uh, even the change in climatic extremes, uh, for example, those related to precipitation, precipitation uh, um, high, higher than one millimeter per day, uh, the number of, day, of days with precipitation above uh, 20 millimeters of above other thresholds, uh, this, uh, um, the, the trend in these variables here does depend on the elevation in many mountain areas of the world, which are represented here in the x-axis. So what you can see is that if you calculate the trend or the change in this climatic extreme, you see that this change is different, taking different elevation bands and is amplified as the elevation increases. So again, mountains are like amplifiers of uh, climate change signals, both in mean values and in extreme values. And so this uh, allows me to go uh, slow it over the conclusions. Uh, of course, we have some needs um, in order to improve our knowledge of the mountain ecosystem, of the mountain processes, of the mountain temperature and precipitation trends, of the elevation dependent warming, and so on and so forth. We need improved observations. We need uh, improved, in particular, in situ observations, especially up to the very highest peaks, because they are uh, 
uh, those uh, uh, which are expected to undergo the most important changes, especially in the future. So they, uh, they should be better monitored than, uh, than in the past. We need to improve uh, and to use uh, satellite data, and in particular to integrate the satellite data information with the, the in situ data information. We need to improve uh, our model simulations, of course, using uh, ideally global models, models, but at very high, sp high spatial resolution, at the spatial resolution which is now used only in the regional models, because this will be very helpful to have into disposition uh, global models which provide an idea of uh, the climate variability and change at the global level, but at the at, at a finer spatial resolution, which would allow to study, to better study also all those processes which strongly depend, for example, on the elevation. We also need to improve our modeling chain, including regional climate models, including stochastic and stat statistical downscaling methods. Be and in particular, what we need to improve uh, is uh, the quantification of the uncertainty which propagates uh, uh, across this, uh, this modeling chain. Um, again, on in situ uh, observing networks, of course, they will need to be expanded, as I was saying before, uh, including a very high altitude areas, which are heavily undersampled, and also the tropical areas are currently undersampled with respect to the mid latitude areas. And uh, the observational networks should ideally include more variables than the standard ones. For example, in order to understand, to better understand the, me the mechanisms behind elevation dependent warming, we cannot rely only on temperature uh, data uh, at the different uh, along an elevational uh, gradient, but we also need uh, other ancillary, I would say, data like humidity, radiation, clouds, precipitation, soil moisture, snow cover, because they are important to understand the mechanisms. So if we don't have this data um, in the same place as where we measure the temperature, we cannot use observations to study the ADV mechanism. We, we can just rely on model simulations as we have done so far. Uh, moreover, we, we should also, um, of course, uh, uh, reinforce our observational efforts in uh, organizing field campaigns uh, to be performed in areas where the climate change signal is expected to be strongest, including transits along three lines as no lines near the zero degree isotherm, for example, for studying the elevation dependent warming. To finish, I would like to say that all these aspects which have been discussed today about the mountains uh, clearly show that these uh, uh, environments are very vulnerable to climate changes. We have uh, today mostly looked at the drivers of the changes observed in the cryosphere, for example, system, uh, or in the biodiversity, which is typical of the mountains or was typical of the mountains. We have not discussed the impacts of, on the cryosphere, on retreating glaciers, on uh, retreating snow, on permafrost, uh, uh, nor the, the changes in the biodiversity, which uh, translates into a huge biodiversity loss. But of course, these are um, some as aspects which need to be considered, at, which are strongly related to our lives at the very end of the story. Uh, at the same time, we need to then consider mountains where these signals are so evident, so amplified as real opportunities to better understand what is happening because they are sentinels uh, of change and to uh, probably develop altogether in a coordinated way more robust approaches to uh, study and integrate different kinds of observations to improve our model simulations and ultimately to uh, think about possible strategies at the end to contrast uh, climate change and to uh, think about uh, adaptation measures. And I think that, yes, this was the last slide. So I, I, can, uh, I can stop sharing my screen. Uh, yes, so that's 15 minutes if you want to pose questions. I will be happy to answer if I can. And thank you very much for being here. <laughs> okay, first of all, thank you very much for 
the very interesting presentation and uh, the, the the microphone is open and the chat too so please if you want to yeah. to ask some questions to elisa please i recognize that uh, uh, i showed uh, some research topics in in, in, in a quiet so yes uh, so, so I, I understand that probably as i was saying at the beginning these are themes which are not familiar to everybody uh, this is the reason why i'm here if you have questions of course so come on don't be shy <laughs> yes if not if not if you if you need some time to digest <laughs> all the information of course we can discuss this uh, in other ways uh, by chat or by email eh? don't, don't don't worry about that They're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe, maybe it, they they understood everything. <laughs> mm, hopefully, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure about that. You consider that these are very hot research topics. Yeah. Uh, which the research community is very much involved, uh, especially in the EW studies. And one uh, one uh, one proof is that uh, is that last year was the first year uh, in which the IPCC dedicated one chapter only to the mountains. So. It's very, very, uh, yes, hot, hot uh, studies. <laughs> so I understand that probably that's too much information to pose uh, yeah, questions. Oh. We are reflecting. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I have a proposal because one participant is, is writing on the chat that they are reflecting yes, and that I is saw. right. I, 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 if you agree, uh, Elisa, and if you have time, obviously, uh, do you mind the remaining connected until the end of the, the session? Oh, of course, yes. I, okay, yeah, thank yeah. you so much. So, uh, uh, if Claudio is uh, is uh, is ready and and agrees, we can start immediately with his uh, last section, and then we, we can open a discussion at the end of the of the day. Uh, okay, uh, maybe let's give just five minutes of time. Absolutely. Yeah. And that then is my law. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the best idea. And so we have a general discussion just at the end. No, if, okay. if Elisa, you have time to stay with us for, for yeah, yeah. one hour. Yeah, I stay until uh, okay. one <laughs> Thanks a lot, Elisa, so we can. No, just five minutes, okay. Okay, I'm stopping now the recording. Yeah.